You're looking live at Times Square in New York City, the crossroads of the country. Good evening. I'm Nora O'Donnell in our CBS News election headquarters. And we are back tonight with the country at a crossroads. What began as election night 24 hours ago is now stretching into election week. Tonight, our powerhouse CBS News political team is here to bring you a special update on where the race for the White House stands. As we come on the air, the president's pathways to re-election are narrowing quickly. As Joe Biden has captured two more key states, he needs to reach 270 electoral votes. Tonight, CBS News is projecting the former vice president is the winner in Michigan and is the presumptive winner in Wisconsin, giving him 253 electoral votes. That is just 17 shy of the 270 needed to win. President Trump has 213. And with more votes coming in tonight, the race is tightening. Tonight, Arizona has just released a new vote count that has Joe Biden leading President Trump by about 79,000 votes. We've got news on Arizona coming up. Also, Nevada, take a look at that. Biden is ahead, but look at this. It is prosciutto thin, with Biden leading by just about 8,000 votes. We're going to get an update on that, I'm told, tomorrow. Georgia is also close, but in the president's favor. He leads Joe Biden, though, by just 39,000 votes. That has been tightening all night. Take a look at this. North Carolina, the president's lead has shrunk to 77,000 votes. Right now, Biden leads President Trump in the electoral vote count 253 to 213. Still, we cannot emphasize this enough. The race is not decided. CBS News has not projected a winner. It is possible that President Trump could come from behind. His campaign has filed lawsuits in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Georgia, all designed to stop the vote count. The campaign is also asking for a recount in Wisconsin. Still without a winner projected tonight, one thing is clear. Despite the coronavirus, Americans came out to vote early by mail and on Election Day. Get this, more than 140 million people voted, and it is the most diverse electorate that America has ever had, reflecting the changing face of this country. And so that's where we stand tonight. And I'm fortunate to be joined by John Dickerson, Ed O'Keefe, and Nancy Cortez. We are back, <laughs> still without a winner, but we've learned a lot, certainly just even in the last couple of hours. We have learning about Michigan and Wisconsin. You know, I want to pick up on your point there about, as you were reading that, I was getting goosebumps. We are in the middle of a pandemic, and 140 million people turned out to vote, and they did a pretty darn good job of it. They adapted in this incredible moment of challenge in America. And yes, things are slow, but you know what? The process is working. The votes are getting counted. And it's just an extraordinary thing. And we've learned a lot about the race so far. We're going to learn more, it feels like, relatively soon. And we're learning a lot about the American electorate and the way they're responding to this uh, incredible moment in American history. I know everybody feeling is feeling a little bit stressed, a little bit anxious. When are we going to know the results? Well, we can tell you. Uh, in Arizona, for instance, they are trying to get more of that vote tally out tonight, late into the night. Georgia, they are promising in Fulton County, which is a big county there that is still counting tonight. Nevada, tomorrow morning sometime. So it's just working through the process, Ed. It is. It is. It's going to require patience, as we warned people it would. Um, but what a difference 24 hours makes. And if you were a supporter of the president 24 hours ago, you were thinking, my gosh, we're going to pull this off. And if you were a Biden supporter, you were a little nervous. But look at how things have flipped. And as if we needed a reminder, this is such a closely divided country. We hold close contests politically in this country, not only at the presidential level, but across the states. And it's just an incredible reminder to the point about holding elections in a pandemic that every vote matters and they're really going to matter in some of these states. And it's no surprise, Nora, that the Senate races that are still outstanding, that we're still waiting to call, are in Arizona, <laughs> North Carolina, <laughs> and Georgia. And the entire political world is watching these races because control of the Senate is still up for grabs. The Senate's leader, Mitch McConnell, said today, I don't know if I'm going to be the defensive coordinator or the offensive coordinator come January. And so, you know, this is, Washington is really paralyzed watching what's happening here. Let, of course, let's Mitch bring McConnell's in, always on offense. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> let's bring in Major Garrett because he is at the, the board there with Joe Biden's possible paths to 270 electoral votes. Well, good evening, Nora. Good evening, everyone. My experience covering presidential campaigns, those campaigns vacillate between optimism and pessimism, but election officials deal in realism. That's the vote count and the mathematics. Speaking of the vote count and the mathematics, both are going on right now.
the mathematics of our very familiar what happens if board. What I want to orient you to here is these states you see in white are the ones where we do not have a CBS News projection. We have a couple to get to in a second. But look at the map right now. The important thing is Wisconsin and Michigan, by CBS News projections, have now gone to former Vice President Biden, putting him at 253. So watch this next stage as it unfolds. Currently, we have Nevada leaning toward the former Vice President, goes up to 259. Arizona also leading. Put that there. If those two trends hold, and I'm not suggesting that we absolutely know that they will, but if they do hold, Nora, with Nevada and Arizona and everything else unresolved, the former vice president gets to 270. Pretty incredible. He could win without Pennsylvania, of course, the state where he was born. Let's talk about President Trump. There is still a path for him to win. There still is a path for President Trump, and it's going to really redound to Pennsylvania. I'll get to Pennsylvania in a second, because that's going to be for the president's interest, the big finish. But let me walk you through some housekeeping that's very simple. Alaska, he's going to win. Add those. Maine's second congressional district, he's going to win that. Let's go back to the map in 2016. Let's say for the sake of argument, President Trump holds Georgia, and he also holds North Carolina. And by some, um, some work of the mathematics in Arizona and Nevada, he claws both of them back. You see at 265. So with Nevada, Arizona, all the rest of this, Pennsylvania is still required for President Trump to earn a second term. That's where the map is for the president and his supporters, Nora. All right. Thank you, Major Garrett. And so there you have it. I mean, the path for President Trump, as we have pointed out, has narrowed at this point. And that's why you see his strategy is what is now the legal strategy, or as uh, his former chief of staff, Ryan Priebus, said, it's we're in recount mode. Yes, they're in recount mode. Um, the question is whether the rest of the country is in that mode. And is, if, if, on the one hand, the people feel confidence in the, in the vote count in these states, the president's going to be fighting against all these state election officials, and that'll be really interesting. He doesn't just have to win in court. He has to win in the court of public opinion as well. Does he? Does he have to win in the court of public opinion? I, I think, mean, it's ultimate. I think well, I was struck by Mitch McConnell, Senator Rob Portman of, of Ohio, Senator uh, Governor Mike DeWine of Ohio, Marco Rubio, Senator from Miami, all said, Contrary to the president's remarks last night, we wait and we count the votes. And whoever, Mike Huckabee even, who is a very <laughs> strong supporter of the president and anything he said, said, look, you count the votes. If you lose, you lose. You win, you win. I mean, they were all saying very different things than the president. And in that distance is where I am building this theory about uh, the idea that if the president is out too far and the evidence shows that Joe Biden won, I'm not sure how many people of his party are going to follow him there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not surprising to see these states in the Midwest sort of in this nebulous category right now. We always expected that they were going to be hard fought. But, Ed, what's going on in Nevada? This is not a state that Democrats were worried about winning. Hillary Clinton won it by two and a half points in 2016. What's happening there? Part of what happened is the, is the pandemic and the fact that that state and its hospitality industry were so decimated, really, economically, it made it hard to know where the voters were. This is one of the few states left where machine politics really play a big role in Clark County and the Las Vegas area, the Culinary Workers Union, which mobilizes, organizes most of the people who work in the hotels and resorts there, had to focus more on the economic concerns of their members than the political priorities of the group. And so Democrats struggled, and they had to rely a lot more on outside groups to step in and try to mobilize their voters. And there were warnings leading up to Election Day that it could be this close because the party wasn't able to do as much work. We have also entered a new phase of this election because President Trump is saying stop the vote count. You see former Vice President Joe Biden saying continue the vote count and saying no one is going to take our democracy away from us, not now, not ever. We heard Biden speak today. Let's bring in CBS's Nicole Killian. She is in Wilmington, Delaware, where the Biden campaign is headquarters. And, and Nicole, what was the calculation be behind the former vice president's remarks today? Well, Nora, the former vice president wants to continue to define the narrative and be transparent about where he sees the state of this race. The campaign remains increasingly confident about its chances. And that is, in essence, what we heard from the former vice president when he was here earlier today at the Chase Center. He said that he was winning enough states to get to 270, but continued to urge that every vote be counted. The campaign remains confident and stands 
by Arizona that it can put that in its column. It also believes it can hold Nevada in part because of support from Latino voters. It also still sees opportunity in Pennsylvania and Georgia. The former vice president also, while he was here, laying the groundwork for a potential speech if he does advance, going back to those key themes of his campaign, one of unity, that he can be a president for all. Nora. All right, Nicole Killian, thank you. President Trump sees things very differently. Want to bring in Weijia Zhang. She is at the White House. And Weijia, we haven't seen the president today at all after he was in the East Room of the White House late last night, sort of trying to preemptively and falsely declare victory. That's right, Nora. President Trump did not have a single item on his schedule today, which he spent inside the White House residence. He was really active on social media, though, posting a series of falsehoods that we have heard from him about the state of the race, even declaring victories in these very key states where ballots are still being counted. But even though we didn't see or hear from him, his surrogates were out in full force, and his senior campaign advisors are publicly saying that they still think there is a good path to victory, especially in Arizona, which they are confident they will win. In fact, they are adamant that any projections that suggest otherwise are simply false. CBS News has also learned that the vice president, the White House chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and advisor, were at the campaign headquarters meeting all day to talk about uh, where they see this going in the next few days. Nora? All right, Wei Zhejiang, thank you. And we are going to start there and dig down on that state of Arizona because it's so key. Let's bring in Anthony Salvanto in the CBS Election Data Center. And, and Anthony, Arizona, uh, Fox News Channel, the Associated Press have called Arizona. We have not. My understanding is there are still some 600,000 outstanding ballots, a lot of that vote trying to come in tonight. Break it down for us. Yeah, uh, Nora, let me zoom in on Arizona here, which in which Joe Biden has a lead, but there's really some pretty simple math going on in a lot of these states. If the margin between the candidates is small, in this case it is, and there's still a lot of votes left to count, then in our view, you can't yet project a race. And one of the things we're going to watch in Arizona as this goes on is Phoenix. And Phoenix holds the key because it casts most of the votes in the state Right now, we think maybe maybe over 300,000 votes still to count there, and we're waiting. We think some of them may come in tonight, so we may get more information there. That's Arizona, and then let me take you up into Pennsylvania. Well, Pennsylvania is interesting because here again, the president has a small lead, but this lead has been narrowing for him as we've gotten more votes in. And one of the things that is bolstering Democratic hopes is that if I zoom in on Philadelphia here, which is a very Democratic area, and we look, there are over 200,000 ballots, we believe, they say, still to count there. So a lot of ballots yet to be counted, elections officials reporting into us over the course of tonight, tomorrow, maybe the coming days, Nora. Yeah, and we should just, I was just looking at now at the Arizona Republic. Of course, Maricopa County is where those 600,000 outstanding ballots are, even though there's just a 79,000 gap between the two candidates. I see that the uh, Arizona Republic saying they estimate around 11 a.m. Wednesday. That's tomorrow when we may have a better sense of that full count being in from. And then we'll have a sense of where that race is actually headed, or it's safe to call it. That's right. And, you know, we should tell everybody for context, the eyes of the world aren't always on it. But it is quite typical that we sit here at the decision desk waiting for elections officials in states all over to count and finish their count, many thousands of ballots, because it just often takes a long time. It just happens in this case we have a very close presidential race, and so everybody is watching. And, Anthony, I'm noticing, you know, when I look at our results, North Carolina has about 94 percent of the vote counted. They had about 94 percent of the vote counted as of 3 o'clock in the morning. So what's been happening in all those hours since? They've been a little slower to report, and they can take longer to return their ballots, too. So we may have to wait a few more, few more days there. Yeah, they have up to nine days in North Carolina versus the yeah. three in some other places. And, Anthony, can you help me figure out, it's basically two different storylines. In Arizona, you have Maricopa County, which is basically a jump ball. It's the two candidates wrestling for the votes in that county. The story in Pennsylvania is 
it's each county is, is a different strength for each different candidate. So you're really what, what, what we're watching to see is basically if the Biden vote can come in and catch up. That's right. Where, where the Democrats have hope is that when Democratic areas in these states, that could be, of course, Philadelphia in Pennsylvania and also, of course, around Atlanta in Georgia. Well, if there's a lot of votes from there and this was another big theme we'll remind everybody from last night that Joe Biden had done well on early vote on mail ballots, which they are now opening and counting. But the president had done very well on the election day vote. So it's those different types of ballots that also distinguish. I want to bring in, thank you so much, Anthony. I want to bring in CBS's Jamie Yukas. She is in Phoenix today and was there all last night. And tell us what you're hearing about the results that we are expecting tonight from Arizona. Well, we did think there was going to be a much larger dump of results that we were going to get earlier in the evening. And as you said, it looks like they're going to start trickling in throughout the night. Arizona in total is supposed to cast about 3.4 million votes. Now, I do want to point out it would be very hard if those 80,000 uh, difference in votes remain between former President uh, Joe Biden and President Donald Trump. It would be very hard to have a recount because you're talking about one tenth of 1%. So you have 3.4 million votes. You're talking about only 3,400 would have to be between the two candidates for it to trigger a recount. Now, I do want to show you what's happening here because there's been a scene here at the state capitol in Arizona. This is Phoenix. There's a few dozen people, I would say, on site right here. They keep going between here and the elections department where there's about 150 people right now that are President Trump supporters and they are demanding uh, access to that elections department. They want to get inside and they, they don't believe that the results have been tabulated correctly and they're angry. So we're going to continue to watch as they go back and forth. It's only about a mile and a half between both places, Nora. You know, it's really interesting as you see what's going on there in Arizona, because if Joe Biden were to win that state, he would be the first Democrat in 24 years to win the state of Arizona. We had already heard some of the reporting that last night uh, when Fox News Channel called Arizona that the White House was furious, uh, that Jared Kushner was on the phone with Rupert Murdoch, uh, who is, of course, uh, the, the media tech titan trying to complain, that it sort of took the air out of the tires for the whole campaign because Trump was feeling good. He had won Florida. He was doing great in Texas. They felt like they were on a roll. And then all of a sudden, Arizona. Yeah, hope for Joe Biden. Again, that public narrative, different from the counting narrative. They don't want to mess up the public narrative. And remember last night, as we were, as the states were coming in, Donald Trump was defending, defending, defending. Arizona was the one good piece of news early in the evening for Joe Biden. Mm. Arizona, as you mentioned, is changing. Maricopa County hasn't gone for a Democrat since Harry Truman, 1948. So that would be a really big change. And it's Part of, the, part of it is all those new people coming in from California, right. which is why it's such an interesting state. I want to also, we can talk more about a lot of these states. I want to also, Nevada is that one other state that's out there. That is that prosciutto thin. That was a phrase that uh, John and I were talking about earlier. I mean, it's less than 8,000 votes right now. Um, there are tens of thousands of mail-in ballots that have yet to be counted there. We're not going to get any more results, we're told, until tomorrow. So let's bring in CBS's Enrique, Enrique Acevedo. He joins us from Las Vegas and tell me what you're hearing. Yes, Nora, well, the six electoral votes from the state of Nevada are now crucial in the pursuit of the 270 votes required to win the presidency. And uh, it's uh, incredible to, to see how, you know, the, the, the number of votes that are separating both candidates at this moment. Right now, the margin of counted votes, the difference is less than 8,000 votes. And to give you a perspective, in 2016, Hillary Clinton won the state by a little over 27,000 votes. So that's the difference right now. Earlier today, we had access to this voting facility where Clark County election staff were um, still processing mail ballots. Uh, around a million votes have already been counted, and that includes all the early vote and the election uh, uh, in-person voting. So tomorrow at 9 a.m., we're expecting more results from Nevada. That's local time, noon in New York. All right, Enrique, thank you. So many people waiting on that. And what we do know about Nevada is that most of those outstanding uh, ballots that have yet to be counted are believed to be from Clark County. 
which right. is Las Vegas, and what is what is believed to be a Democratic stronghold. It's a big reminder, too, that so many of these southwestern states are built around their super cities and that most of the politics are done in just that one place. And Nevada was one of those states that mailed a ballot to every eligible voter in the, uh, in the state because of the pandemic. Doesn't mean everyone was going to use that ballot or mail it back, uh, and that's what's caused some of the confusion here and what potentially the size of the electorate would be but a good example of a state adapting in the midst of this pandemic to voting. We are on the verge of having so many more details about how these states are breaking. When we come back, we'll take a closer look at the vote in Pennsylvania and why Philadelphia may hold the key in the Keystone State. You're watching CBS News 2020, America Decides. After a long night of counting, it's clear that we're winning enough states to reach 270 electoral votes needed to win the presidency. I'm not here to declare that we've won, but I am here to report when the count is finished, we believe we will be the winners. Well, there you have it, uh, Joe Biden with his running mate, Kamala Harris. Pennsylvania began the day after Election Day with more than a million uncounted votes. That's why the state is still considered a toss-up. Jerika Duncan is outside Philadelphia's convention center where they have been busily counting the votes all day long and where the Trump campaign today filed suit to try, filed suit, rather, to try and stop the ballot counting. That's right, those election workers inside the Pennsylvania Convention Center hard at work 24-7, if you will, counting those ballots, trying to get uh, those results as soon as possible. The election officials warned that there was going to be a delay because this was the first time that you had mail-in voters, 2.5 million of them, compared to 260,000 in the last presidential election. So it's going to take a little bit longer, they said, but the governor here, Tom Wolf, said the fact that there is a delay means that the process is working. They're ensuring that they're taking their time to make sure that ballots are counted and that the results are accurate, Nora. And then just quickly, what has the Secretary of State said about when we will know the vote count in Pennsylvania? They're not giving a specific timeline, but we do know that more of those votes have been counted. They said that it could be as late as Friday, but they would not say exactly when. But they do know there is an urgency to get those votes counted and get those results official, get those All official right. results, rather. All right, Drika Duncan, thank you so much. The Trump campaign is taking a different tack in Wisconsin, where it is calling for a recount. And Adriana Diaz is outside the central count location in Milwaukee, where they are tallying up the ballots as we speak. Adriana? Hi, Nora. We actually have a new location by the riverfront here. But what's really crucial here is that it's still unclear whether or not the Trump administration has actually filed an re official recount request with the state's election commission. And that's because, according to the rules, that request can't be made until votes are audited here in Wisconsin. And that's not expected for another two weeks. We asked election officials if they've received a recount request, despite the rules saying it's too early, and we haven't heard back. But here is what we do know. Here in Milwaukee County, election officials are starting to think about what a recount would potentially look like during the time of COVID. And we have learned that they actually plan to meet on Tuesday to discuss how to do a recount here uh, while keeping their staff safe. Nora. All right, Adriana Diaz, thank you. Interesting there, as even the former Republican governor, Scott Walker, laying out that it would be a uh, steep hill to climb for them to find enough votes to make up that difference, the lead, essentially, that, that uh, Joe Biden has over President Trump. Now, in addition to that recount, President Trump's lawyers have filed lawsuits today in Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Michigan laying the groundwork to challenge the results in those battleground states. David Becker is our CBS News election law expert. And David, what is the effect of these lawsuits? What will they do? Well, so far, they're not doing much. I mean, they're, they've, they're trying to stop the count in these three states, while at the same time, they're arguing to continue the count in states like Nevada and Arizona. And I think it just shows how untethered from any kind of facts or law or principle these lawsuits are. These states are continuing to count whether 
uh, Vice President Biden is ahead or President Trump is ahead. And they're going to continue to follow state law and the process that was established before to count all the validly cast ballots that are in. And they're doing a remarkably good job of that, regardless of whether they're run by Democrats, like a state like Pennsylvania, or run by Republicans, like a state like Georgia. And we saw the Pennsylvania attorney general saying there's essentially no merit to uh, the legal arguments that the Trump campaign is making today, saying it's more of a political statement than a legal set statement. But explain what exactly the Trump campaign is trying to do in Pennsylvania. Well, in Pennsylvania, there was a lawsuit pr earlier that went all the way to the Supreme Court, was decided four to four, which upheld the lower court decision, which said that the um, that which which upheld the three day um, after election day receipt for mail ballots, so long as they were voted on election day. So um, there are going to be some late received ballots coming in. The Secretary of State has said that they are going to segregate those ballots. They are going to count them, but keep them segregated to some degree. And ultimately, I don't know if the Supreme Court wants to get involved in this again. Those ballots may be moot in the sense that uh, Vice President Biden might be leading before those ballots are even counted. In, a, in an odd, ironic twist, it might actually be the Trump campaign that has to do a 180 and ask for those ballots to be counted because they're behind after all of the Election Day and earlier ballots are counted. Uh, that's really interesting. David Becker, stay with us. I mean, here you have essentially um, a, a wide ranging legal assault by the Trump campaign because we still don't know. So it sounds like they're setting themselves up for an area where they can specifically contest a state that they would need in order for their path to victory. Yes, and there is the David mentioned, I thought quite well, the, the feeling in a way that the, the, the um, Trump strategy is kind of has its shoelaces tied because in one state it's asking, saying keep counting, another saying don't count. In Michigan, there were protesters on the, the President Trump's side saying stop the count. The only way he can win in Michigan is if the count keeps going. And it, I mean, it's not going to catch up at this point, but there's this way in which it, it's at odds with itself across the nation. And we should note, of course, that vote count actually in Michigan, which we have called for Joe Biden has actually widened. Joe Biden opening up a wide lead today in that state. As uh, you can see there, it is over 120,000 votes at this hour. All right, coming up, new votes, new information all coming in. And we'll look at how Joe Biden took back two of those blue wall states, Michigan and another in the Midwest. You're watching CBS News 2020, America Decides. This is a very big moment. This is a major fraud in our nation. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at 4 o'clock in the morning and add them to the list, okay? Well, the counting has not stopped. It continues. Want to bring in CBS's Major Garrett. He's been pouring over the exit poll data, looking at who voted and why. And Major, the vice president, former Vice President Joe Biden, was trying to win by picking off some of the support that Trump had. Was he successful? He was. And for those of you with us last night, welcome back to Major's Exit Poll Emporium. For the, those joining us for the first time, remember, admission is free. The information is valuable. Independence, Nora, you just asked about this. Here's what happened in 2016. Donald Trump carried independence across the country by four points. Let's look what happened in 2020. Joe Biden carried them by, four, by 14 points. You can tell that's an 18-point swing. The important dimension there, the most important dimension, independence this time said they just didn't find that the president had the proper temperament, and they believed former Vice President Joe Biden did. 18 points, that's incredible. And then also Michigan and Wisconsin, that blue wall. How did Joe Biden win in those states? Those are now projected by CBS News as victories for the former vice president. Let's dig into a little bit about how that happened. Union households, 56-41 for the former vice president. That's an improvement over Hillary Clinton's performance. White voters with a college degree, Joe Biden carries them by six. And this is 12 percent of Michigan's vote. They did not vote at all in 2016. Four point edge for the former vice president. Th so those are people who sat on the couch and didn't show in up or are they new voters. And they're, they're new voters. They're new voters. And they, Joe Biden carried them by 4%. Let's go to Wisconsin and take a look at what happened there. Young voters, 58 36 for Joe Biden. That is a 19 point improvement over Hillary Clinton in Wisconsin with young voters. That's voters under the age of 30. Women voters, 56 43. And those who defined the COVID the virus, 
rather, as the top issue favored the former vice president, as you can see, by an incredibly wide margin. And, of course, Wisconsin is being struck very hard by coronavirus. They are running out of ICU beds. Uh, the governor there is telling everybody to wear a freaking mask, I think, is the last message that he had for residents of that state. We're, we're waiting for you were at the wall earlier today. Yep. Arizona. Waiting we're waiting for Arizona. Arizona. We at CBS News have characterized it as likely Joe Biden, but right. there are some 600,000 outstanding votes. But what does the exit poll data show us about that state? So let's look at seniors in Arizona. They comprise in this election, nor in team, 30 percent of the electorate. Joe Biden, 52 percent. President Trump, 47 percent. That is an 18 point swing from 2016. Seniors. I mean, it just goes to show you how we are different in every state. If the seniors in Arizona are voting for Joe Biden, but in Florida, for instance, they voted for President Trump. Right. Exit polls tell us a lot of the whys, not, not only for the nation, but they also tell us very fascinating whys in different regions, different states, and among different demographic groups. And what you just contrasted between Arizona and Florida helps us understand those. And Major, what do we know about young voter turnout in this election, more broadly? More broadly, it's slightly up. But again, by state, by sometimes, by state, it's parallel to what it was, yeah. almost exactly the even as to what it was in 2016. But in some states, it's gone up just a tick. But I wouldn't say, based on everything we've looked at, that there was this massive young youth vote that showed up. Mm -hmm. In some states, it was. But I wouldn't say nationally it was a big revolution. It really does feel like we are entering this new phase of the election because today, as we've got more numbers come in, and we're really expecting overnight this in, this whole other batch. Arizona, we just talked about all that coming through the night. Nevada saying they're going to update us at nine o'clock their local time, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. A uh, Georgia, that Fulton County that we talked about, that it's incredible that that ruby red state is actually such a razor thin margin there uh, for Donald Trump. There, that vote tally coming in overnight as well. It seems like we're very close to learning what is the final step of this race. That's right. It does feel like we're very, very close. And um, I want to just add one more piece to the Arizona puzzle, which we saw in other states. Women with college degrees. Donald Trump won them by two points in 2016. Joe Biden won them by 17 points this, this time around in Arizona. White women with college degrees, and those sometimes are called suburban voters. That's another piece of what Donald Trump, uh, what uh, Joe Biden, when he did well, that's what he And did. we saw that early in the night yesterday, that swing among that voter group. What does that tell us? Why? Some of it is temperament. Some of it is emphasis. Those voters clearly cared about the coronavirus more than the economy. Those who did care about the economy decidedly went for President Trump. But it varies by region. It varies by demographic group. But in these key states where Joe Biden focused, he got what he needed and is moving closer and closer to that magic number of 270. Which is interesting because Democrats in Washington today were so glum. They're the only political party that can be in a terrible mood when their candidate <laughs> is on the verge, potentially, of winning the presidency. But they well, were so disappointed in, you know, their, their, their Senate showing and in some House losses. Right, because there's really a decoupling the there. There's a decoupling there. There wasn't momentum down ballot for yeah. House races or Senate races. But there really was a kind of Biden and then the rest of the Democrats and the kind of decoupling that surprised a lot of people. And this is messy and it's taking a little while. And I think, you know, in a few days, maybe a few weeks, it'll look different. If, if Biden is able to win Arizona, take back a state that hasn't trended Democrat for a long time, yeah. and eke out a win in Georgia, they will have accomplished a, a big part of their wish list, which was to become competitive in the South and the Sun Belt plus take back those Midwestern states. And that is what they believe is the future of their party, the well, ability you, to appeal to both ends it, of the country. Like it's that. a good way to set up what I'm about to say, because coming up next, the peach state has been forbidden uh -huh. fruit for Democrats. Uh -huh. So can Joe Biden change that? You will not believe how slim that margin is. I think the last, it's now down to about 39,000 in Trump's favor. What could change that? You're watching CBS News 2020, America Decides. Sixteen electoral votes are still up for grabs in Georgia. President Trump leads, but tonight that race is tightening significantly. CBS's Mark Strassman joins us now from Atlanta. Mark, they're actually counting the ballots pretty quickly there tonight. They are, Nora, and, and here's why. There's a really a couple of very interesting storylines to follow here in Georgia, where, as you mentioned, those 16 electoral college votes are very much up for grabs. When Donald Trump got up this morning, he was 116,000 votes ahead here in Georgia. Right now, that lead is 37,000 votes. 
and dropping fast. Here's what's happening. There are 90,000 outstanding absentee ballots in Georgia. Most of them come from metro Atlanta counties, which are increasingly younger, more diverse, and more receptive to Democrats. For Joe Biden to pull ahead of Donald Trump, he essentially has to win two of every three outstanding ballots. And that is very much what is on the minds of both the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign. If it sounds like it's time to call a lawyer for, to protect your interest if you're in those campaigns, well, the Trump campaign already has. They sued Chatham County, which is the Savannah County, uh, Savannah, Georgia area, claiming irregularities. The vote titles probably won't be announced until tomorrow morning, but definitely something to keep an eye on here. Wow, Mark Strassman, it looks like it's almost down to 30,000 now. Let's move on to North Carolina. President Trump has a slight lead there, but it is still a toss-up. CBS's Chris Van Cleve is in the Tar Heel State. Good to see you, Chris. Nora, the president leads by about 77,000 votes. It's about 1.4 percent of the 5.5 million or so votes that were cast here in North Carolina. That's a record. But the question now is how many more ballots could still be out there? We know there are 116 to 117,000 potential unreturned absentee ballots. However, many of those made it into the mail and were postmarked by yesterday have until the 12th to arrive and be counted. And now the state told us today that the boards of elections in the 100 counties in the state aren't even meeting until the 12th or the 13th to consider those ballots as well as an unknown number of provisional ballots. So the bottom line, we're not going to have any real new updates from North Carolina until the end of next week. Nora? Fascinating. Chris Van Cleve, thank you. I want to bring in Anthony Salvanto now because he is crunching all of those numbers. And so, Anthony, will you take us inside Georgia and North Carolina? I will indeed. Okay, let's go into Georgia. And we are looking at an extremely tight race 49 7 for the president, 49 1 for Joe Biden. So a difference of 0.6. And let's dive in here to, first of all, Fulton County, which we get reports that they will keep counting late into the night. Uh, maybe after midnight, we might get some more reports there, um, which, I, you know, I can tell you, Nora, the, uh, the kind folks on social media have noticed that I have been standing here for two days uh, <laughs> crunching these numbers. Uh, I, I want to assure everyone I am fine. The coffee here is very good. Uh, but why is Fulton County that. important? I know that, that it's down to 30,000 votes, that, yeah. that, that lead that Donald Trump has. It's really important, uh, and you will look at that number, because this is a Democratic area. And so if the Democrats are going to pick up ballots, pick up votes, this is where they might have the best chance to do it. Now, look, all over the state, if there are ballots out there, there will be Republican votes out there, too. And that could, you know, in theory anyway, that could add to the president's margin as well. So we'll have to see what happens. But this is where Joe Biden is pinning his hopes. It really is. You know, DeKalb there, let's see what's out, you know, 9,000 ballots. But in a race this close, all of them really matter. And so I think we'll get some more in there tonight. Right. Those Atlanta suburbs that have become increasingly diverse younger, the types of voters that the Democratic Party thinks that they can court and put into the Joe Biden column. And as Anthony was saying, DeCab, uh, Biden is winning at 83-16. Fulton, he's winning 72-26, which means he's getting the bulk of the votes that come in there. Those are very, very rich Democratic areas. Just a few seconds go inside North Carolina, the votes that we're waiting for there. Why is it so tight, that race? Yeah, very, very quickly, uh, we'll do the same thing. Democratic areas, still 37,000 ballots out, for example, in Wake County. Same story, fast-growing metro areas, diverse metro areas, places the Biden campaign would like to pick up more votes. Right, and as Chris Van Cleve noted, that state has the rules that they can continue to count those ballots that were postmarked on Election Day for several days. They allow for a slower counting of the vote there. Anthony Salvanto, thank you. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll look at who will control the United States Senate. Senate. It's late. I've been here. But what I was going to say is so important, it actually changed the stock market today. You're watching CBS News 2020, America Decides.
we may not know who controls the U.S. Senate until next year. So to help us explain why, CBS Chief Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes. So, Nora, Democrats are going to add to their seats in the Senate, but it's kind of like getting a bike for your birthday is really nice unless you thought you were getting a car. <laughs> so they thought... <laughs> <laughs> they thought they were getting the car. They thought that they had a really good shot at taking the majority in the Senate. And it's still possible, but to do it, they would have to ride that bike through some very challenging territory, namely North Carolina and Georgia. They need to win two more seats, most likely. So North Carolina, still a toss-up at this hour. And the margin between Tom Tillis and Cal Cunningham is a little larger than the margin between President Trump and Joe Biden. President Trump and Joe Biden are about 1.5 points apart, and this race is 1.9. The polls were so apart. wrong. They, they was, were they were so wrong. They were going to saying that that Cal Cunningham was going to defeat the incumbent here and in a lot of places. So Democrats are doing a lot of soul searching today, trying to figure out why their data was wrong, whether they didn't turn out the right people, whether they didn't register enough voters, and they're watching this race. Another race that they're watching very closely is in Georgia where David Perdue, you'll notice, is ahead of the Democrat John Ossoff. But take a look at where Perdue is. He's at 50.2 percent. If Ossoff can pull him down, as we continue to count the, count the votes, below 50 percent, this race will actually go to a runoff, which will take place in January. We already know that the other Georgia Senate race is definitely going to a runoff in January. So that's why we may not know which party controls the Senate until then. And the control of the so in the Senate is so important because whoever, whomever is president needs the Senate to really get judges passed, any of their big agenda. Right. Even having one or two more Senate seats changes the whole ballgame for Democrats. All right, Nancy Cordes, thank you. And we'll be right back with some closing thoughts. Welcome back to CBS News Election Headquarters in Times Square. And, John, I just think about what we're on the cusp of finding out in the next few hours, maybe the next 12 hours. Yeah, we may know the different where the way this election went. But the way the two candidates behave in the next two weeks or whatever will we'll lay the groundwork for the politics they inherit, whoever they are, whether it is a molten mess or whether they cool the partisanship in America. So how they behave is going to help set off their next four years. To that point, uh, the Biden the Biden team believes that he's on the verge of ending his 33-year quest for the White House. Tonight, he's launched the Biden-Harris transition website, buildbackbetter.com. But he's also tweeting to his supporters, asking them to donate to a new legal defense fund in the event they need to help bankroll a legal defense of his victories in these states. Mm -hmm. And I think no matter who wins the White House, Mitch McConnell could remain the most powerful man in Washington, because everything needs to go through him if he retains control of the Senate. He is going to be able to set the agenda. If Joe Biden wins the presidency, wants to get anything done, he's going to have to see if Mitch McConnell is willing to work with him. We have witnessed record turnout in the midst of a pandemic. A passionate group of Americans doing everything possible to let their voice be heard through their votes so that they can help decide the next four years, not only in who inhabits the White House, but many of the other things that people voted for. Our election coverage continues with your local news on the CBS station tomorrow on CBS This Morning. And I'll be with you throughout the day tomorrow as updates happen. Until then, I'm Nora O'Donnell at CBS News election headquarters in New York. Thank you for joining us and good night.